and I'm Heather Arnold, local history librarian here at Case Virginia Libraries. So thank you for attending our talk today. So this is a look at our farming industry and it's a celebration of farming and agriculture in our region, both past and present. And it will be scheduled it for September because of course September is traditionally the Royal Melbourne show time, but of course that's not on this year, it wasn't on last year. So we're looking at a celebration of our farming history. And you may all remember if you lived in this area for very long, that wasn't that long ago, that as soon as you left the townships of say Narry Warren, Berry, Packenham or Cranbourne, you would hit a farm. So this, of course, has long gone. And this is just a look at Berwick in the 1950s. A nice sort of scene with some milking cows, a bed dairy cows in the paddock. And this is the a look at uh, Berwick 1964. This is Wilson Farm, which is now the Timbara Estate. So this is how this whole, most, a lot of this region has now changed from farming to uh, to suburban areas. So we're going to have a look at the farming industry in this area from the arrival of the Europeans in the 1930s, the 1830s in fact. <laughs> so um, it was uh, in the 1830s that the first European settlers and the cattle began arriving in the area. John Hyatt was said to have been the first to take his stock across the Dandenong Creek in, in 1836 to settle near Frankston. And the next to um, cross the Dandenong Creek with cattle was said to be Terence O'Connor, who had um, bought cattle for um, Captain Robert Gardner, who had the Melville Park property at Berwick. And it was a few years later that Terence O'Connor took, uh, uh, took up his own run, Cadinia Creek, also at Berwick, and both, of course, based on the um, Cadinia Creek. The third settlers who crossed the Dandenong Creek were the Ruffy brothers, and they went to their, uh, they had a run at modern-day Cranbourne, Kudmayoon. So we'll have a look at this um, map here of the various um, squatting runs. So this is the um, Mayoon here. This is where um, the Ruffy brothers had their land, and that's um, modern-day Cranbourne. This is Gardner's property here on Captain Robert Gardner's property on um, the Cadinia Creek. The Cadinia Creek 2 run is uh, the one that Terence O'Connor had. And um, um, essentially, um, so that's that one there, sorry. And we'll have the IYU is a Pakenham. Ginger Bean is the one at Officer, just to sort of give you some idea of what uh, of the landscape there. And Danny Nong is... That's Hampton Park here. Anyway, so there's some of the original squatting runs here, all taken up in the 1830s. Um, so we had the Ruffy Brothers who went to Cranbourne, and the next lot were um, in 1839, Robert, Den Robert Jemison and Samuel Rawson took up the Yalek Station. We'll go back to here, which is down here, south of the Kurup Swamp. And they had, um, they had, Come across by overland to Sawtells Inlet, which is Turidan, and then from Sawtells Inlet they took took a they went by water across to the mouth of the Yellow Creek, just south of Courier up there, with their cattle. They came with um, three men and a married couple as well. That's Samuel Rawson, and the site of the Yellow uh, Station is actually there's a memorial on the South Gippsland Highway, a little picnic area. Uh, between Kurup and Monomeath, and that's the site of the Yellick station taken up by Rawson and Jamison. So the settlement at Yellick station was probably fairly typical of all the early um, squatters settlements, and they were very basic. There was Rawson and Jamison had three huts, uh, one for one for them, one for the men, and one for the married couple. And there was also a dairy. And this here is actually apparently um, the Ruffy brothers' um, hut at Cranbourne. Um, illustrated by, sketched by John Henry Hayden in the 1830s. And as you can see, there was nothing grand about these early structures. They were just basic, you know, basic structures. And then it wasn't really until um, 20 years later, the, nine, the 1850s, that the, the more grand houses were built. This is the IYU homestead at Pakenham, built in 1858 and burnt down, in, sadly, burnt down in 1929. And another early, um, more significant structure built at the time was Harewood, which is still there, built from 1857 onwards. So that's what, um, as, as the, um, the, the uh, squatters sort of consolidated and got richer and richer, they built grander and grander houses. The, um, in 1840, 
um, Rawson and Jamison went to Samuel Anderson's property at Bass River and collected a supply of wheat and they soon had seven acres of wheat growing and by November 1840 the uh, Yellock station had 931, 931 cattle including 291 breeding cows and 12 working bullocks and that would have been fairly typical of the way most of these um, stations started but some of the um, squatting runs in this area also had sheep so the IYU station which was taken up as I said on the it was on Tumac Creek uh taken up by William Kerr Jamison who I believe is no no relation to Robert Jamison he had a lot he had sheep as well so um and as this um these properties were quite large the IYU estate had nearly 13,000 acres the Raffi brothers at Cranbourne had 32,000 acres and even the smaller estates were, were up to 5,000 acres. They were held by leasehold. Uh, in the 1850s, government land sales were held which broke up these large estates and squatters could purchase by preemptive right their homestead block, generally about 640 acres or one square mile. And even though many of the original leaseholders still managed to purchase land, it did allow others to move into the area, such as uh, William Clark, who purchased the Springs at Berwick, Archibald McMillan, who purchased land at um, South of Kurup, which he called Coldermead, and the partnership of Miracle, Bakewell and Lyle, that dissolved in Lyle's property, Monomeath, was established. So there's this interesting book called Rural Industry in Port Phillip Region and Lynette Peel was published in 1974 by Melbourne University Press and, and the author looks at various regions around um, the Port Phillip, around Port Phillip Bay from those states there and she, um, she looks at a region she calls Berwick, which is essentially probably the old Shire of Berwick area. And she has some very interesting statistics about land use um, at the time. So this is the Berwick area. And as you can see, in 1856, there's just over 1,500 acres sowing down to wheat. 10 years later, 2,500 acres growing sowing down to wheat. But by 1880, which is 25 years since the first day, there's only 48 acres sowing to wheat. So wheat had got less importance, less important as the years went on. Potatoes grew in importance, which makes my heart sing being the daughter of a potato farmer. But um, you can see this column here is interesting that uh, the acres sowing down to lucerne, lucerne or pasture has had increased from 382 in 19, 1860 to 5,000 acres in 1880. So that's sort of showing the growth of um, or the move away from wheat, wheat probably to, um, to sheep and cattle, or especially cattle in this area. And just other interesting figures, uh, vineyards have always been quite small, but by 1880, the amount sown down to orchards had grown quite significantly. Another interesting lot of statistics she has is the number of livestock in the area. So if we look especially at this figure here for total cattle numbers, in 1856, the Berwick region had 4,200 head of cattle and uh, 25 years later had 22,000 head of cattle. Um, horses might remain, or they sort of started growing and remaining consistent. And uh, sheep also increased quite significantly between 1850 to 1880. And also, although that number of sheep looks quite, um, quite high compared to um, the other areas she looked at in the Western District, we had very quite a small number of sheep in the area and goats also remained relatively small. And the other interesting figure that she uh, shows, the author shows, is a number of holdings. So um, in 1857, there's 101 holdings, or that's a number of farms. By 1881, there were 649. Because what had happened from the 1870s onwards was that the, the big properties that had been um, owned by... Um, the, the big properties originally being subdivided were subdivided again and this allowed um, other smaller farmers to move into the area so as you can see significantly by in the first 25 years from 1857 the number of people who owned farms had increased by um two and a half oh by by oh there's my mask on you can see it here so it had increased quite a lot so um and this would sort of be and so this allowed sort of 
people with more, more limited capital to move into the area. And this gave the rise of the small family farms. And it's really small family farms that were the mainstay of the rural economy of this area from the 1880s onwards. And indeed, most family farms, you know, any farms that survive in the area today are still small family farms. Small family farms, of course, relied on the generally unpaid labour of all family members. Parents and children who fed the hen, had to feed the hens, weed the garden, feed the calves, milk the cows, collect the eggs, plough the paddocks, plant crops, fix machinery. There was a never ending list of tasks. And often this work was done by the children before they went to school and after they went home. So I have a few photos here. This is of my um, grandparents' farm at Coral in the 1930s. Of course, feeding the pigs, it's my auntie and my great auntie. Feeding the shooks, of course, that's my grandma and my auntie. And this is my uncle and my father with their father playing in the fields. And even though this all looks like fun, for most children who grew up on farms, very soon fun turned into work. And that's the life of a small family farm. Small family farms were encouraged by government schemes uh, because there was various government schemes to break up the large land ownings. And these schemes included the village settlement scheme on the Kurup Swamp and uh, the closer, closer settlement board and the soldier settlement schemes, as well as the scheme that we had called the Overseas Settlers from Britain scheme, which we'll look at these schemes. The village settlement scheme was established um, in response to the 1890s depression. And the aim was for settlers to find employment outside the city and to boost their income through the sale of produce from their farms. And so the village settlement scheme was established on the Kurup Swamp at these towns here. You can see it, um, Kurup, that's Yellick, Yellick here, Five Mile, which is Kurup North, Verville and Iona. Um, under this scheme, all the workers had to accept a, a farm up to eight hectares, so quite small farms, 20 acres, eight hectares. They spent a, sp spent a fortnight um, working on the drains and a fortnight working for wages to, um, working on the drains for wages, and then a fortnight working to improve their block. Um, there was actually glowing reports in the paper about these small farms initially. So this is a view of a settler's home allegedly in Kurup in 18, on the Kurup Swamp in 1894. And there was this account in the age, all down the line of the main drain, a settler's houses of canvas felt or weatherboard and around them are gardens of luxuriant growth. Nearly every settler is already practically independent of the rest of the world in the matter of food. They would certainly be entirely so if they were vegetarians. They have potatoes in abundance and the most excellent quality cabbages weighing 10 to 15 pounds, turnips of prodigious size and a multitude of other garden products of really superior quality. So these were the glowing reports in the paper. And of course, it wasn't all, um, wasn't all like this in reality. Many of the people who took up these small farms were quite um, unused to physical labor. They, were, they were, had to suffer floods and fires and bushfires. Um, once the wages for working on the drain stopped in November 1897, unless their farm was successful, many of them actually left the swamp. So that was one scheme to encourage small farmers that wasn't always successful. Another scheme to encourage smaller farmers was the um, Closer Settlement Board, the Closer Settlement Scheme. So in 1904, the Victorian government legislated to purchase private estates from landowners and to subdivide the land uh, to make the land available to farmers of limited means. And in this area, there was the Helen Valley estate, which is sort of centered around um, Golf Links Road to the north, Greaves Road to the south, and between Berry Clyde Road and Nary Cranbourne Road. And so where the old old cheese factory is, if you know that in Homestead Road, that was one of the that was part of the um, what became a, a closer settlement subdivision. Um, and in this subdivision, the State Rivers and Water Supply Commission purchased land and cut up into blocks of 10, 10 acres to 16 acres. So you can see how small the farms actually were. And another um, closer, closer settlement subdivision was in Narrawarra North. So this is the this is um, Narrawarra North Road. This is Fox Road here. And these small blocks, so they're 14 acres, 13 acres, 33 acres, 35 acres, as you can see, quite small farms. These small blocks were either settled as 
a soldier settlement farm or as a closer settlement board farm. So if you'd been a returned soldier, you could apply for a soldier settlement farm. And um, so this farm here, Les Lowry's farm, he was a returned soldier. Arthur Street was a returned soldier. Uh, Mr. Evans here was a returned soldier, but this property here is Mr. Brundit's. So if you know Brundit's Roses, they've been in, um, or were in Narry Warren for decades and decades. Mr. Brundit had a closer settlement farm property and he had this 19 acres here. So this was a, a way for small farmers to come to the area and most of these farmers here, apart from Mr. Brunder, who came into Roses, they had either, either a, a dairy farm or a poultry farm. And we're very lucky to have, um, this is Mr. Lowry here, to have, um, there's a photograph of his house in, in Narry North Road, that was his soldier settlement house. And this is a nice photograph here of his, um, his dairy farm. They, so, um, Interestingly, so these, these small farms in Narry North were basically, as I said, only up to, you know, 16 acres or so in size. But there was another soldier settlement um, development in this area in the Kurup region, which had much larger blocks. So if you know um, Pagram South or Rithdale, there's Soldiers Road in Rithdale. And that is, is because it was a soldier settlement area. That's why it's called Soldiers Road. And there's this interesting table here, which is from... Um, Gunson's book, The Good Country, Cranbourne Shire, and he shows that in this settlement here, instead of the, instead of the, um, they're, they're quite, they're much larger farms. So this Hagglethorns estate and McGregor's estate is pack, both at Packenham South. So the average allotment was 111 acres, 60 acres, or Coldermead, 55 acres. And the number of settlers are listed here, 14, 37, and 55. And, and what happened was, was that um, not all soldiers or not all soldier settlers or the close aboard settlers were, caught, were successful. For sometimes the blocks were too small. Some of it was poor country. It was badly drained. And, um, and a lot of World War I soldiers, of course, had other psychological issues. So, but, so some of them walked off their farms and they were bought out by neighbouring farms. So you can see here in 1937, which is uh, 15 years after the, or so after the area was first established, the allotment size had increased from to 187 acres from 111, but the number of settlers decreased. So basically neighbours were buying out neighbours. McGregor's estate, the number of settlers had gone from 37 to 18, but the farm side had increased from 60 to 110. And once again, in Coldermead, you can see here, settlers had decreased to 33, but the size of the allotment had increased. And that's pretty much been the pattern of... Um, like on, on the swamp settlement schemes, closer settlement boards, that six, um, for, for, for various reasons, people don't stay on their blocks and the neighbours buy them out and get bigger and bigger. There was also another interesting scheme that was started in Victoria called the Overseas Settlers, Overseas Settlers from Britain scheme. And what happened is they bought all these people out from England and they were given a lease on farms and um, and they were supposed to sort of make a go of it on their farm. So it wasn't sort of super successful because there was a lot of complaints, 300 complaints, in fact, and so many complaints that they held a Royal Commission into um, this scheme in 1931 to find out whether the complaints were justified and if the Victorian government had failed to fulfil their obligations to the settlers. So we have um, George Owen of Yanathan, he actually gave evidence at this committee, at this Royal Commission. And we're very lucky that we've got photographs of his farm at Yanathan. That's from the um, biggest family history. What's it called? Uh, the biggest family album on the um, Museum's Victoria side. So that's his little, little house at Yanathan. And that's the Owen children picking up sticks or something. And this very cute photo here. Of helping of the of the Owen children helping their dad build a trough on their farm at Yanathan. So Mr. Owen had come out here in uh, 1925, and he tells his story to the Royal Commission. Before coming to Australia, I was a saddler and leather worker, earning five pounds ten a week. Early in 1925, I saw an advertisement of the Victorian government offering land for farming. This attracted my attention. I thought it'd be good to come to out to Australia on the terms shown for the sake of my children. At Australia House, I was told that I could get a good mixed dairy farm at £10 an acre for a capital value of £1,500. Before I came to Australia, I could plough and milk. 
I went to Elko, the government farming training farm near Geelong for a few weeks and then took up the block at Yanathan. The area of the block was 66 acres and the price was 33 pounds an acre without improvements. I was told that I could make a living on this block. The land is unsuitable for cultivation because of the drainage and he, he said the debt should be wiped off and the valuation reduced. That is the only solution. I have since gone um, he received the, the block next door, he increased his acreage, and that was um, at £27 an acre. And he said, this shows that the board has admitted that the land should be revalued. So Mr Owen came out here from Britain on um, promises made by the Australian government with high hopes, told the land would be only £10 an acre, had to pay £33 an acre, which was clearly overvalued. And he uh, gave evidence in 1931, but by 1935, he'd left the farm and the family had moved to the city. So his is really a typical story of some of these um, other farmers who come out from England who, who thought they uh, would have had, who, who, who perhaps uh, were misled by promises from the um, Australian government. And who'd have thought that would happen? So... Now, so we have these farmers, small farmers, and of course what farmers want to do is to, um, is to show off the results of their labour and, their, and to improve their farming methods, and so agricultural societies were formed. So it, the Moody Ponds Farmers Society was established in July 1848, and a month later changed its name to the Port Phillip Farmers Society. And the Port Phillip Farmers Society had three branches, Gisborne, Beckers Marsh, and Mornington. The Mornington branch was established in 1856. The Mornington comes from the uh, county of Mornington, which is in land administration terms, is the county that we're everywhere, basically everyone in the, in the city case of Shire Gardenia is in the county of Mornington. Um, the Mornington Families Farmers, the Mornington Farmers Society held their first plurry match in 1857 at Mr. Walton's farm near Dandenong. And Mr. Walton was Thomas Walton, and he had a farm at what we are now called Narry Warren. He'd come there in 1852. And the site of his farm is now the Fountain Gate Shopping Centre. So that was where the first ploughing match was held. And the next year, the ploughing match was held at the property of the Reverend Alexander Duff in the township of Cranbourne. And the Reverend Alexander Duff had amongst his land um, a block bordered by Russell, Bakewell, Cameron and Childers Street in Cranbourne, which is now occupied by the Cranbourne Primary School. And so they held their first ploughing matches at uh, these locations. And then every year until 1890, the venue changed from somewhere in Berwick to somewhere in Cranbourne. And from 1890, the, um, the shows were held continually at, at Berwick. And this is the old Berwick showgrounds in Clyde Road. That's where... The, um, the university is now Nussel High School. That's the old Berwick Airfield here. Um, in um, 1918, the Mornington Farmer Society became the Berwick and District Agricultural and Horticultural Society. And of course, they're still holding shows now. So they're the um, remarkably long-lived organisation. And uh, they moved from the, show the showgrounds here in Clyde Road to Coona Park in 1963. So Berwick is the longest running show um, organisation in this region, but the Lang Lang Agricultural, Agricultural, Lang Lang Pastoral Agricultural and Horticultural Society, they held their first show in February 1901. And this is a, dress of, a photograph of very well-dressed attendees at the Lang Lang show in 1906. The first show at Bunyip was held in March 1900 and the Pakenham uh, first Pakenham show organised by the Pakenham Agricultural and Horticultural Society was held in 1912. Oh, and there's a great little count here of um, the first Coraline Horticultural show was held at Keast Hall, um, which is the public hall in Coraline in 1916. And the local member, Mr Keast, was there. The, the hall was named after him. And he said... The show was a natural display of the fertility of the district and the industry of the tillers of the soil. Uh, the display of goods was highly creditable. The ladies, without whom an exhibition would be a failure, pleased the eye by their gorgeous display of fancy work and literally caused the mouth to water by the appearance of preserves, confectionery and the many tempting objects that they alone know how to produce. And of course, there were not any local shows, but there was, of course, a Royal Melbourne show 
which has been held in one form or another since 1848. So um, various, of course, local farmers all um, showed off their cattle or whatever at the Royal Melbourne Show. This is uh, Alexander Cameron's Ayrshire Bill, which was the 1891 of Royal Melbourne Show champion. Alexander Cameron had the property um, Mayfield at Cranbourne. So basically where the Cranbourne Library is now, that was part of his property there. Another exhibitor at the Royal Melbourne Show a bit later on was Mrs. Hartley of Piney Ridge. Uh, and she, Mrs. Hartley, the Hartleys had um, 640 or 260 hectares of what is now Endeavour Hills. So where the Endeavour Hills Library is was Mrs. Hartley's farm, Mr. and Mrs. Hartley's farm. And they had a Jersey stud. And this is Mrs. Mrs. Hartley preparing Hawaiian dot for the Royal Melbourne Show in 1948. And we also have this photo here in 1960. Uh, this is my father and my uncle. They displayed, um, they demonstrated the washing and packing of potatoes on machinery supplied by Port Implements. And they, they were there at the 1960 show. So this, of course, if you've ever been to the show, brings back uh, memories of what the show used to be like, which is really like a celebration of agriculture rather than what the show is today, which seems to be a celebration of sideshows and everything else. So it's always been right from the start, the people in this region have not only uh, shown off their livestock and their produce at local shows, but also the Royal Melbourne show. Um, farmers, of course, they like to display their products, but they also want to sell their products, of course, and that was the main reason of being a farmer was to make money. And so markets developed. So the day on market, was originally located on the corner of Lonsdale and McRae Street and opened in 1866. It moved to its present location in Clough Street in 1926 and 1958. The stock market, the stockyards moved to Cheltenham Road, and um, they, the stock market section closed in 1998. It originally started trading just um, casual pigs and sheep, but by the 1870s, it had grown to livestock fruit, dairy products, lard, honey, hay, and other farm produce. And local farmers from this region and beyond, beyond travel to Dandenong all the time, for the, all the time it was opened, to sell their produce. One such example being Elizabeth Andrews. So Elizabeth Andrews, she, was, uh, she lived on the family farm at Hallam, which had been taken up by her great-grandparents, the land had been taken up by her great-grandparents at Hallam in 1854. So she was still there, the last of them family to live there and she operated a dairy and sold her butter and her eggs at Daniel Market which she transported on her cart pulled by Tim her little black pony. So Miss Andrews died in 1934 age 85. So Miss Andrews would be typical of the small farmers in the area who sold their small amount of produce at the Daniel Market just to make a living. So in my own family um, in 1948 they purchased at Austin A40 Ute from Grinchley's Garage in Garfield. And even though my father didn't have a license to drive, he used to drive down, drive to uh, the Dangnon Market with his parents and, in, and they used to sell um, eggs, the eggs, chicken and calves all carried in the back of the Ute at the Dangnon Market. So they came from Coralin, Miss Andrews came from Hallam, but everywhere through that region, people went to the Dandenong market to sell their produce, or of course, to buy their produce. So we can't underestimate the role of the Dandenong market in the, in, the life of, um, in the life of the people in this region. Other markets uh, in the area was the Cranbourne market established 1889, but that closed down in the 1930s due to competition from, um, from Dandenong market. And of course, uh, there was, for larger farmers or large scale farmers, there was a new market, new market sale yards, which operated the suburb of Flemington, opened in 1859, closed 1987. But I found these interesting photos because not only, of course, are markets a place to sell your produce, but they're also a social gathering place. So these are just photos of some locals at the new market sale yards in February 1949. So that's Councillor Kinsella from Coralin talking to Mr. Donnelly of Cranbourne. And this photo here is Mr. Beaumont of Berwick talking to Mr. Jeffers of Dandenong. So it's just interesting to find some local photos, of, photographs of local people at the show, at the new market sale yards. Uh, 
course, once the railways came through, that was a boom for local farmers to send their produce to market. So there's been four railway lines traversing this region of which three are still operating. So the earliest one was the Gibson line that went to sale and that was fully opened by 1879. The Great Southern Line commenced construction in 1887 and was fully operational from Dandong to Cranbourne by June 1891. So that went from um, Dandong, Cranbourne, right through to Kurup, Lang Lang, right down through to South Gippsland. There was, of course, the Puffing Billy Line, officially called the Ferntree Gully to Gembrook Line, which opened in December 1900. And finally, the Strzelecki Line, which went from Kurup, Bales, Katani, Yanathan, etc., to Strzelecki and which operated between 1922 and 1959. So from the 1890s, orchards were planted in the hills from Narriwarra North to Garfield, and this produce was railed to Melbourne to be exported interstate and overseas. Milk, livestock and potatoes grown on the, on the Kurup Swamp were sent to market on trains from Katani and Bales and Kurup, Tainung and Anagoon. Timber products and potatoes were loaded at the Gembrook Station on the Puffinbilly Line. So Carl Nabilius, the founder of the Gembrook Nurseries at Emerald. Uh, he originally had sent his trees 16 miles to the Narriwarren station by Dray, but when the Puffin Billy line opened in 1900, he had his own siding erected. He was, of course, a huge producer of, of, um, of trees. And it's said that before World War I, at the peak of his business, uh, Nabilius Nurseries had over 3 million trees in various stages of cultivation for sale, and most of those were shipped out by rail. So on the subject of trains, they're not only used to carry produce to market, but for education. And the Better Farming Train was established in 1924 by the Victorian Railways and Department of Agriculture. The train travelled around Victoria, stopping for a day at various country railway stations and provided lectures and demonstrations to farmers to improve farming techniques and therefore raise agricultural production. And if agricultural production was raised and the railways would benefit as all as nearly all produce at the time was moved by rail. The train made 39 tours of country Victoria between 1924 and 1935, and over 250,000 Victorians attended the various uh, lectures that were held during that time. Um, the train consisted of 15 carriages, which contain information exhibits about different areas of agriculture. So this is the potato one, and there's also one on dairy, beekeeping, poultry. The train also carried livestock, cattle and pigs, enabling the hands-on approach to the subject. The inaugural stop, the very first stop, was actually held at Bunyip, was Bunyip, and that was on October 13, 1924. It was met by the Shire President, who was Councillor Dorp, and the Prime Minister of Australia, Mr Stanley Bruce, and the Railways Commissioner, Harold Clapp, were also in attendance. Um, over 1,000 people actually attended the Better Farming Train at Bunyip on its first day of operation. And there's a whole lot, series of lectures in the afternoon, such as on Frisian and Ayrshire cattle, grading cows, herd testing, grasses and top dressing, bees and honey, potatoes. And for women, the lady women, the lady folk, as they call them, were not left out because they had lectures on needlework and mothercraft and child welfare. And that's some of the ladies here with their lecture on child welfare. It was an amazing, uh, amazing government initiative, the Better Farming Train, and clearly was, was um, welcomed by farmers all throughout the country of Victoria. Right, okay. So we're gonna have a look at some different types of farming carried on in the area. And of course, uh, dairying has always been a, a, big, a big farming enterprise in this area. As an early significant dairy was operated on Sir William Clark's property, the Springs at Berwick. Um, although he never lived at, um, on his property, Sir William had a, quite an interest in and encouraged scientific farming. I gave his tenants long leases and moderate rents to encourage them to be progressive, progressive farmers. Um, he built this cheap, the model cheese factory, on, which is still there today, you can see it today, on his farm in 1875 and employed... Uh, Murdoch MacDonald, the cheesemaker. And Murdoch MacDonald, he in turn employed uh, a dozen workers and milked 200 cows daily and made 150 cheeses a week. And Mr Murdoch was there until 1888. 
Another large dairy farm in the area was operated on um, the Tumac Creek south of Pakenham. So in 1884, John Kitchen and Sons, and they, they were soap manufacturers in Melbourne, and they made, amongst other things, uh, velvet soap and soul bowl soap. They took over the old IYU property from George Watson, who had been the master of the hounds, and he'd had the property since 1866. So in 1884, the Kitchen Brothers, the Kitchen, the Kitchen and Sons, developed the biggest dairy farm in Australia. And they milked 300 cows on one side of the McGregor Road and 300 cows on the other side of McGregor Road on the Green Hill property. All cows were milked by hand and at one time they employed 60 people. And, but sadly, the depression of the 1890s put paid to the business and they had to sell the IYU property. But we'll hear more about the Kitchen Brothers, the Kitchen family soon. Another large dairy in the region was George Hope's Dairy at Cranbourne. So he'd taken over the Cameron's property on Narry Cranbourne Road in 1911. He'd originally started his dairy in Kooyong Road in Caulfield, 1911, moved out to Cranbourne, and he supplied milk to the Lady Talbot Institute, Lady Talbot Dairy Institute. Um, so basically, in 1908, the Lady Talbot Milk Institute was established to supply pure bottled milk to infants to reduce the uh, deaths caused by unsanitary milk. So before refrigeration and pasteurisation uh, and with general low standards of hygiene and germ control, and unsanitary milk was the major cause of death and illness in, in young children. And of course, it could cause tuberculosis, gastric upsets and diarrhoea and typhoid. So Lady Talbot established the Milk Institute and this milk was uh, provided free of charge to poor children in the inner suburbs and the milk came from George Hope's farm, dairy farm at Cranbourne. However, these are uh, examples of quite large dairy farms. And in reality, most dairy farms in the area were quite small. So this is a photograph of Mr. McClellan, George and Margaret McClellan's farm at Lindhurst. And they had only, uh, they only milked 44 cows. So they were quite a small farm. And he sent his milk off every day from the Lindhurst railway station. And this is Mr. Clark's dairy farm at Helen Valley. Mr. Clark milked 35 cows, him and his wife, Norman Clark and his wife, Clara. And they, um, so they were quite another sort of small dairy farmer. And Mr. Clark and Mr. McClellan are typical of the small dairy farmers in the area, not milking 300 cows a day, but you know, 44 cows, 20 cows or something like that. And of course, the fact that we had such a strong dairy industry led to the rise of local cheese and butter factories. In the 1890s, there were over 140 such butter or cheese factories in Victoria. And around 1930, the area could sustain several factories due to the fact that there was a huge amount of dairy, for a start, there was a huge amount of dairy cows in the area. So it's estimated that the parishes of Kurup, Kurup East and Yalik, so that's all the Kurup Swamp plus Yanathan and Coldham in that area, they had 12,000 dairy cows in the 1920s. Secondly, farmers still use horse and cart to transport um, their milk to market or their milk to the factories. And so therefore they had to be quite close. And thirdly, factories had different purposes. So the whole milk could be, um, whole milk could be received as Ion and Coraline, whilst farms with a separator could deposit cream at Lang Lang or Bales. So depending on, what, how, on how your farm operated as to which factory you went to. So there's a whole raft of local factories established. Uh, this is the Coraline Cheese Factory, as I said, established 1910 and closed 1940s. The Bales Milk Factory operated between 1922 and 1980. We're still going when I was at school. The uh, Lang Lang Butter Factory operated between 1895 and 1940. And of course, the Anathan Factory, which operated in the, from 1900 to 1920s. And farmers could also send their milk to Melbourne on the train. So after the Strizlicky line opened in 1922, it is said that in 1923, the year after it opened, that the milk train carried over 1,000 gallons of milk per day from the local stations. So farmers not only sent their milk to local factories, but also sent their milk on the train to Melbourne. Well, have a look at the orcharding industry. So it's thought that William and Francis Bailey, who uh, they, they started the first commercial orchards 
in the area in 1891. Uh, they purchased, um, in 1891, they purchased land in the area and planted about 50 acres of, of orchards in Nary North. And sort of from then onwards, you can see, you know, there's been orchards all the way along through Officer Packenham, South, Packenham North, North Packenham Upper, Garfield, etc. There's a whole orchards all the way down the railway line. Um, of the of the um, Bailey Orchard, it was taken over later on by their son James, who be who was married to Lucy Webb, who was Sydney Webb's daughter, and that's their little boy Sydney. So orchards, of course, have played an important part in the economy of this area, and orchards need uh, places to store their apples before they're sent by train. And so cool stores developed. This is an area Warren cool store when it was operating in the 1920s, 1930s and 40s. And this is it just before demolition in, I think the 1970s or 80s. And even if you grew up, I mean, if you know Packenham at all, there's still cool stores in Packenham you could see till about 20 years ago. But the biggest orchard in the area was run by the Kitchens who had the biggest dairy farm in the area. And that was the Tumac Valley Orchards. So they were established in uh, the 1880s and eventually by the by the kitchen the, the kitchens and they eventually grew to they had 200 acres of orchards and they pioneered the um, apple exports to the UK so in 1913 alone it was estimated that the orchard yielded 70,000 cases of apple and each case is 170 apples so it's 12 million apples so you can see what a huge enterprise that it was. And they employed lots and lots of people as well. There's houses for managers and workers on the site. It was a huge enterprise, uh, but it closed in about the 1950s. So that was part of our, part of our farm in history that's no longer there. Some of the other um, produce grown in the area included gooseberries. And we're lucky to have this photograph taken in the 1890s of Mr. Abel Thorpe's gooseberries at Jembrook. In 1891, Mr. Abel Thorpe established a nine acre orchard at Jembrook and he grew apples, pears, peaches, oranges, lemons, plums, quinces, grapes, wine berries, tree tomatoes, chestnuts, currants, gooseberries, cape gooseberries, raspberries, strawberries, figs, cherries, locusts, and other fruit. An amazingly versatile little orchard he had. And these are his gooseberries at Jembrook. Ah, oh, we'll go there in a second. Um, vineyards. I found an account of uh, from 1867 of Franz Schmidt, or Schmidt, it's smelt two different ways, of Berwick, who in 1867 showed a very promising Riesling wine he, um, and a hermitage of very light character at the Port Phillips show in 1867. And in 1873, he exhibited uh, a Riesling at an exhibition in Vienna and the next year here we see the honourable mention. So we do have a very small, um, you know, wine, wine um, industry in the area. And Thomas and Eliza Walton, who lived at um, Fanny, who lived, as I said before, where Fanny Shopping Centre is, he, uh, they also grew, grew um, tobacco, flax, and he had two acres of vineyards, and he made a good dry wine. Her, this is. I found this, this is really interesting. So this is geraniums, at, harvesting geraniums at Berwick. So I came across these photographs and um, back, 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 sorry, I mean, sorry, Baxter is, um, used to be part of the Shire Cranbourne, so I'm allowed to include it in this talk. It's sort of part of our region historically. And this property, this, this crop was grown on the property of Russell Greenway in the 1920s. Geranium oil was used in the manufacture of perfume. And Russell Greenwade was the son of um, Frederick Shepherd Greenwade, who established the company Felton Greenwade and Company, and they were manufacturers of drugs and perfumes. And so it, apparently half an acre will sustain 800 geranium plants, giving 2,250 pounds of geranium leaves. That's over a tonne of geranium leaves. So if you feel like going to small farming, you could start growing your own geraniums and harvesting them. And that's another pick, another photograph of harvesting geraniums at Baxter. So Mr. Grimway not only grew geraniums for the perfume industry, but I came across a report that he grew drugs for the pharmaceutical industry during World War II. That it was reported in the paper 
thousands of pounds worth of digitalis, heroin, hyoscine, opium, and other deadly but life-saving drugs were produced during the war from 10 acres, which are part of Mr. Grimway's beautiful estate. Now, that was interesting. Now, asparagus. Asparagus, of course, is in season at the moment. They're cutting it just opposite me or in the paddock opposite where I live. So the first commercial, first commercial crop of asparagus was grown in 1912 by Thomas Roxburgh on his farm at Burval, which is next to Coral Inn. By 1932, he had 120 acres under asparagus, most of it being canned by the guard sides at Dingley, Rosella or AJC. And by 1939, the Curiop Swamp had 1,300 acres under asparagus. During the Second World War, uh, the Roxburgh Farm had the Australian Women's Land Army girls working on the property. And they'd been um, established, the Women's Land Army, in, um, during the war too, um, because there was a gap of agricultural workers, because of course the men had all enlisted to go to war. So Mr. Roxburgh was interviewed and he said uh, that he was very proud of his girls, as he called the Land Army girls, poor women. Uh, he think that... They, though physically they cannot stand up to the same speed of work as men, but they, he thinks the five girls can do the work of three men. They're steady workers, and once I've told them what fielders I want done, I do not have to worry again. So the women did all the cutting, the placing the spears in the bundles, picking the bundles onto the cart, and then they worked in the packing shed. Um, they lived on site in a camp, which was run along the, the lines of a girls' guide camp. They... Um, the day's a long one. The girls rise at 6.15. They're in the fields at 7.30. They have an hour for lunch. Then they spend 20 minutes having a rest and work finishes at 5.30. In spite of this long day, the reporter said, after work, the girls often rode the six miles on bicycles into Garfield to go to pictures or go to a dance. And that day I was there, several girls were going to walk two to three miles to a dance. So they are very fit. A lot of these girls had already come from farms and of course working on the family farm, as I said before, was an unpaid labour. But these women working the land army actually got paid. So same work they would have done at home, but with more money. And this is them at uh, Burvale, and it's another one there in the packing shed. Today, 98% of all Australian asparagus is grown in Victoria, most of that on the Kurirup Swamp at Delmore, Coralin, and Kurirup. And I have to talk about potatoes. I grew up on a potato farm at Kurirup. So uh, by 19, that Kurup, Kurup Swamp, Caroline actually, on the Kurup Swamp. By the 1920s, the Kurup Swamp was producing one quarter of all Victorian potatoes. It's a bit less now, but it's still a major potato growing area. But like all farming areas, uh, there's less, less farmers, but bigger farms. Um, so my dad used to, my dad, Frank Rouse, used to load potatoes from Garfield. So all potatoes in the 1940s until 1954 had to be sold through the potato board and had to be loaded at a prescribed area. So in this case, we loaded at Garfield. They were then sent to the, um, to the potato board railway yards, the marketing board of railway yards, Spencer Street, and then sold to the board. If you were sold out of the board, you were actually find massive fines. So... Before they were loaded, and they were loaded by the farmer, they had to be inspected by the potato inspector, Jack Stalker. This was a Garfield, Dad says. Originally, apparently, he was a fan of the Volkswagen Beetle, Mr. Stalker. So if you wanted to get your potatoes passed, you just talked about Volkswagens. If you told him you were a bit worried about them, then he would pass them. If they weren't passed, then you had to empty the bag, remove the bad ones, repack and re-sew the bag. And as I said, the farmer said to also um, load every single railway cart which you can imagine is um, a lot of hard physical work. So this was taken at Garfield, but these next photos were taken at Up. So that's just trucks on the railway station waiting to uh, unload. And the next photo is lined up in Station Street. So it just shows you sort of the um, amount of potatoes that were, that were grown in the area. And of course, um, the importance of potato to the Kura region was shown in the Potato Festival, which was held between 1973 and the year 2000, which celebrated all things potatoes. And that is, of course, King Spud there on the back with Glenda Doherty, who was the Spud Queen that year, Potato Festival Queen that year. So this has been a very quick look at the history of farming in the area. There's more things that I could mention. 
such as uh, the growth of um, companies that supplied to farmers, such as Gendor and Turidan, which started in 1948, 73 years is still going, 73 years later, it's still going strong. So there's Gendor, the Turidan, Porter's Farm Service, the Pakenham, Grainwood Machinery. There's lots of other uh, machinery supply uh, places that have sprung up to supply the local farmers. Another aspect of the farming area, farming industry, I haven't spoken about young farmers clubs. This is the Narry Warren North Young Farmers Club. But um, so the schools had their own young, their own clubs, but also um, th they, they grew up with social groups as well for, for, for older farmers, older farmers. And they sort of provided, young farmers clubs provided a social outlet, a networking outlet, and often a marriage partner, because that's how you met your partner at the young farmers clubs. I know a few people who met their, um, their partners there. And of course, another aspect of our primary industry I haven't spoken about is uh, the fishing industry, which, which was out of Turid and, and some of the other Western Port um, harbours, but that was also a big part of our um, primary industry. So today, the market gardens in Clyde, Cranbourne, et cetera, now almost swallowed up by housing, but some of that has now moved to the Kirrup Swamp. And, and Kirrup Swamp, for instance, more vegetables, cabbages, broccolini, lettuces, leeks, strawberries, are now growing where there used to be potatoes and dairy farms. And if we can hopefully stop the ever increasing suburban sprawl and protect our valuable farmland, then we might continue to have an agricultural industry in our region for years to come. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you for listening. That's where I got all my images from. Thanks Very everyone. Informative. Thanks for listening. Yeah. And um, we'll see you um, around somewhere, somewhere else. Yeah.